in some ways, uh, the necessity for this type of seminar is really superfluous. I think everybody understands the imperative of Kira Vrachaikim, the idea that if HaKadosh Baruch Hu has children, I mean, imagine a family that would have ten children and uh, eight of them went off the derech totally. Is it in a chamet to a parent to say, well, you have two kids that are you know, following in the right way, who cares about the other eight? That would be crazy. That certainly would not give a parent chizuk or strength. And kaviyocha l'gabi HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if we live in a world where really 80% of the, of the Jews in the world are not connected to Yiddishkeit, are not connected to Torah, then if you simply care about HaKadosh Baruch Hu's covered, if you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're going to try to bring the children back. That's why the Rambam says in Sefer HaMitzvahs that Kira V'chaikim is not only a Bein Adam it is not only the way I help another person, it is an expression of Ava Hashem. How can you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu and not care about what happens to the children? It is also, of course, again, I don't have to repeat, we heard a beautiful talk before Mincha, V'yahavtil Recha Kamaycha, if you really care about somebody, if I give you a cup of coffee, <laughs> if I give you life, I give you taira, I give you mitzvot, how much more so? That's much more than a Starbucks or, or whatever whatever it would be. So the imperative of Kira V'chaikim is, the I think, a very obvious point. It is very interesting. They tell the story that uh, the Chazenish, who the first 50 years of his life, he came out, was a nister. He was very not involved in public affairs. He was in Vilna. This is before he came to Eretz Israel. Even then, he was working with people one-on-one, -on -one, but he was not a man of the seaboard. And uh, he was finally deciding, you know, should he change his role in life? Should he assume a greater involvement in Klal Yisrael? And he went to ask the Chavitz Chaim. The Chavitz Chaim was the big gadol, the big shayel, the one that everyone asked dates of. And he couldn't get to see the Chavitz Chaim privately. After all, the Chazanish wasn't so famous yet. Uh, so he's sitting in a crowd, and the Chavitz Chaim is speaking, and pe many people say they experienced this, that somehow the vort the Chavitz Chaim was saying to the crowd was exactly what they needed to hear. And the Chavitz Chaim was talking about the acharayas we have towards other yidin, even if that means we, we, you know, we don't learn as much as we otherwise could learn. And the Chavitz Chaim said in his humility, look at me, he says, even I, the Chavitz Chaim said, I could have been a Talmud Chacham too if I didn't spend so much time trying to help other Yidin. So anybody could be a Talmud Chacham if they're not involved in, other, in helping other people. But we're mechayev to help other people. And the Chazanish saw that that was his answer from the Chavitz Chaim, how he would devote his life, and indeed he devoted the rest of his life. Um, of course, he continued to steig and learn and write svarim, but at the same time, he spent so many of his hours helping others. So I think it really is a double pushet in a sense. There's no reason uh, to talk about this other than to repeat things that everybody knows because it gives them chizuk and it makes them recognize how important it is. But another aspect that we need to keep in mind is that Kirov is too important to be left to the professionals. On one hand, or Lagola, an excellent, excellent program, a first-rate program uh, that prepares people for the world of Kirov. But sometimes people think you need professional training, you need teacher training, you need to know all of the reasons why evolution is, you know, uh, doesn't, doesn't fit, etc. And the person might say, I'm a regular Yid, I'm a regular Jew, I don't know all this stuff about evolution, I don't know age of the earth. How can I be Makarev Rechaikim? How can I be involved? They're going to ask me a question, how do I know the Torah was given at Mount Sinai? You know, I mean, I believe it, but I, I, I don't necessarily know all of the proofs. What am I supposed to do? So because of that fear, people are Moshe Chiyad, people who are not necessarily outreach professionals, even if they're B'nai Torah, and even if they learn, they know how to learn. They don't want to get involved because they basically say, mm, I don't have the answers to all these questions. Well, the secret actually is that the answer to the questions, you know, the questions are important, the answers are important, they're also a chalik of Torah, but Ali the Yemes, that is not what makes or breaks a person's commitment to Yiddishkeit. A person is not going to decide to become from because you have proven to him the Torah was given at Harsinai. And the reason is simple, uh, simply because Tivus are so strong that just because even if something is emes in their brain, there's a big, big distance between the brain and the stomach or whatever it would be. And all of the philosophical reasons in the world are not going to make a person change their life. 
and le'idach kisa, and on the other side of it as well. Even if there's going to be questions that you can't answer, I can't answer, no. Every person, there are many questions in Torah that we're not necessarily able to answer no matter how many years you've been in this, in this field. That also is not going to, a person's not going to say, oh, I'm, I'm becoming an apikaris because you haven't given me an adequate reputation of Darwin. What really makes people from, and what keeps people from, is the sense that they see that the Derech HaTorah is a good way of life, that it creates good marriages, it creates good families, it's a Torah of chesed, of love, of care, of concern. Not in every case. Sometimes, you know, we're not perfect either. We have many, many failures. But if Bederech Chlau, they can perceive that the Derech of Torah is a good way because it creates a bond of love and togetherness and striving and it's a, a way of getting away from the materialism and superficiality of the world. People will look for it. They will be attracted to it. After all, our neshamas are already attuned to be connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Torah. We just need some Yisairis, some type of awakening. So, even if you don't have answers to the questions, if you're a person that can create hospitality, warmth, friendship, if a person senses that you care about them, that you are concerned for where they're going in life, and you do so in a non-judgmental, non-critical way, you don't kind of say, you know, you're a piece of garbage now, but I could, you know, maybe fix you up somewhat. That, that's not a very effective Kirov approach. Then Mimela, people will become from, people will gravitate towards Taira because they just want to be part of this. In this world today, and maybe it's a chisarin, maybe it is a chisarin, and maybe it's a little different than it was in the 60s and the 70s. In the 60s and the 70s, you know, we had backpackers who were exploring all of the philosophies of life. They went to Kathmandu and they went to India and they went through all of the philosophies and Eastern religions and the like. And as a result, perhaps the approach, maybe this was the episode of when Orsamer started, the approach had to be something that was grounded in philosophical argument and in the elusive search for truth, where people would be screaming, is there absolute truth, is there not absolute truth? And that was almost, almost a motto in Orsameach in those days. I have to admit, although I'm not in the dorms at all hours, so I don't know, I hear this, you know, this scream of absolute truth, I hear it a little less than I used to hear it. Now maybe people discuss it at different times. But the truth of the matter is, because we do live in a more materialistic time, we live in a more superficial time. Even in college campuses, people are not sitting around debating Kant's, Plato, uh, philosophy. Unfortunately, people are involved in the taivas and the decadence of Ailam Hazem. So in a sense, what needs to be given in our chinuch, in our hadracha, in our kirov, without neglecting the other component, is not so much a counter-argument to the philosophical antagonisms that one might have to religion, but a counter-argument to the decadence of a lifestyle that is superficial and empty. And therefore, the old saying, used to be an old saying, that the Repetzins Cholent uh, made more Baalei Tshuva than the Rav's Drushes, uh, has a very, very strong validity. Not so much, you know, Cholent versus Drusha, but in terms of warmth and connection and care versus the intellectual structure. Now again, I don't mean to say don't be an intellectual. I don't mean to say, don't analyze, don't think. Obviously, we have to think. All in of Talmud Torah involves thinking and working, and through our mind, we connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But you have to understand that academic learning and philosophical speculations and uh, arguments are not going to make and break the life decisions of a person. Now, maybe Mamish Talmud Torah is sitting down and learning uh, you know, Gemara and Taisus, maybe that will, because that's Hama'or Shabbat Machsi Rav Musaf. Okay, that I'm willing to be Makabal. But I can tell you that a five hour argument about the proof of the existence of God is not Nichlau in Hama'or Shabbat Machsi Rav Musaf. That does not have any automatic effect that will bring a person to Akadish Borhu. It may convince him intellectually, and then you're back to the problem of square one that the intellect and the Taivas are operating in two different ways and the automatic ruchnius of Amor Shabbat does not really apply to that part of, that, that part of uh, kind of an academic discussion. So the upshot basically is that you don't have to be, and you shouldn't have to be, 
a Kirov professional to be Isaac and Kirov. What you do have to be, and maybe this is even harder than being a Kirov professional, is you have to be a person who cares. Now that's not so pushy, and if you're a person who doesn't care, something to work on, but don't get involved in Kirov. Uh, I mean, uh, that, that is Emma's. Uh, maybe your Avaida at some point in life is to serve Hashem in different ways until you reach the level of caring, and then you do Kirov. So the point is, that if there is a qualification for Kirov or Chaykin, it is not having so many answers to specific questions. It's caring about the people that you're dealing with. It also means respecting the people that you're dealing with and recognizing that when we deal with another Jew, we're not just there to teach, we are also there to learn. That the concept is that person has something that he can show me, he can teach me. Maybe not necessarily in information, although sometimes in information, but maybe in commitment, maybe in yearning, maybe in wanting to grow. Right? Many people say, as I remember years ago, uh, you know, Lincoln Square Synagogue in New York, I think I'm allowed to mention it in the base matters yet, uh, there's, a, there's a Jewish outreach program, Rabbi Ephraim Buchwald ran it, uh, still runs it, for many, many years. And uh, one year they had a banquet, I guess they have a banquet every year, and they honored a person who was very involved in Kirov for Chaykin. And the name of his uh, talk, he gave a talk, Why I Hate Balei Tshuva. And it was a fantastic talk. He says, I hate Balei Tshuva because when I come home Friday night, I want to have a 15-minute meal and go to bed. And right when I'm about to bench, all of a sudden he asked me a question. I don't understand the Rashi here. I don't understand the Mishnah here. The point was, it was a very affectionate talk. He was basically saying, that what we learn from people who are newcomers to Judaism. We learn renewal, we learn excitement, we learn passion. And, and if you approach the idea that I'm not just here because I'm up here and you're down there, whoever it is, you're down there, and I'm here, milmala lamata, to be mashpia on you. But if we understand it is a shared experience where we learn and we grow from each other, then you're ready to be a makarif, you're ready to do this job. You have respect for the person, you care for the person, you love the person, and uh, you're willing to be open to what that person brings to the table as well. So even if you don't have definitive answers, you can say to the person, in fact, it's the same thing with a parent and a child. I don't know, let's go learn, let's open up a safer and learn, let's go ask a rub or ask somebody that may know about this. And that itself is a great lesson, because that tells the person whether it's your child or whether it's someone that you're trying to bring into Judaism, that tells the person that Taira is a lifelong learning experience. It's not simply you finished and you graduated. You know, they tell the story about the great uh, Rabbi Eliezer Silver, he's a great Gadol, and uh, legend has it, he lost his first shelter. He came to America after World War I. I don't want to mention the city because it's Shtigal Lashon Hara, but he lost his first shelter uh, in a small city, uh, and the president fired him, this was in 1920, because he didn't like the fact that he was wasting electricity in the show at night. So when Rabbi Silver said, but I'm learning, and I'm learning in the show. The president said, that's the point. I thought we hired a rabbi who finished his education. So again, you see how ludicrous it is. Baruch Hashem, we've been zocha in our door to have G'dayle Yailam, who are, you know, we're over 100, are over 100, we're over 100, still learning, learning. I mean, gee, you figure, after 95 years, Rabbi Yashif should get it already. You know, what is he still doing after 95 years? The answer, is, right, Taira is Ein Sof. So the MS is, even a statement, I don't know, let's go learn about it, is an important message. That itself is a hadracha. That itself says, we got to keep learning, we got to keep growing. There's never a situation where I've made it. I know everything there is, there is to know. So a person shouldn't be afraid. If your heart is good and you're a caring person, you will be matzliach in one way or the other. And if you're not matzliach to totally change a person, again, hatzlacha is not only measured by 100%. Even if the guy's not going to be in Kailo or whatever it is, if the person has a better attitude about Torah, a more positive attitude, you never know where that's going to come. It may affect who he marries. Will he marry a guy or a Jew? It may affect whether he sends his child to a Jewish day school or a public school. So it might be the seed that you're planting may not have an effect even on that door, so to speak.
but it may plant the seed much later. But they say Ryakov Kamenetsky, when he would be in a, in a waiting room in a doctor's office, and there would be uh, kids playing, so Rabbi Yaakov would take the ball and toss it to the kid and have catch. He was already, you know, 85, and he would play catch with uh, little kids. And people said, uh, it's not Lefi why, 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 why is the Rav doing that? And he said, I want this little Jewish kid to remember that there was an old rabbi with a beard who used to play ball with him. And the Mela, when this kid that grows up, he's going to remember, you know, rabbis aren't as bad as people think. They're kind of nice people, nice people too. And Rav Yaakov said, who knows, who knows what that could lead to? You never know. Why squander an opportunity? So in that sense, again, I'm, I'm saying Devar and Peshutim, the Devar and Peshutim are basically is, is a chiv. It's, it comes both from Ava Hashem, Bein Adam L'chaveirei. It is also a reflection, obviously, of Kol Yisrael Ha-Reven that every Jew is responsible. So if there's any chisarin among anybody, it is my chisarin, it is not just their chisarin. And as the Talmud Yerushalmi says, when you have a boat that has a hole under the seat of one person, it is no defense for me that it's not under my seat. The whole ship is going to sink because of the hole under him. And uh, they say, they also interpret the Zayar HaKadosh that way, that the Zayar HaKadosh uh, tells us that there are 600,000 letters in the Sefer Torah, and that's connected uh, the 600,000 Nishamas of Kal Yisrael. And people ask the obvious question, there are far, far less than 600,000 letters. There's around 325,000 letters. That's way beyond the margin of error. How is it shy to talk about 600,000 letters? There are different pshatim. But one of the pshatim that's given is that the spaces between the letters are also letters. But they're covered up letters. And these are the letters of those Yidden who have not yet made their connection to Tyra. And therefore, the Sefer Tyra B. Etzem is not complete until those letters are Niskala. And Kishem, that if the Tyra is missing any one of its letters, the whole Tyra's puzzle, in a sense, even the hidden letters, until they're Niskala, are Sefer Tyra's puzzle. So, in that sense, the Kiruv Rechaikim, I think, is an obvious imperative of our generation. But as I say, you, know, you have to uh, determine and you have to try to be sure that you're not going to do more harm than good. And that is a function not so much of knowledge or lack of knowledge, that is a function of uh, personality and the amount of care that you can bring to the equation. Okay, that's kind of, of a of half dhamma. But Lamaisa, we have to recognize the following. We have to recognize a problem that has been known in the industry, so to speak. And I hate to talk about it as an industry because it really should not be an industry because people are not commodities. And that is what might be called the problem of second stage Kira, which is actually a very, very serious issue. Baruch Hashem institutions like, like Or Sameach, other, other yeshivas, have had over the years, almost 50 years now, a great Hatzlocha in taking people uh, off the street, off the wall, people who uh, really had no shaykhs with Judaism, and exposing them to the beauties of Taira, to the beauties of learning Taira, and many, Again, we don't have a 100% success rate either, but many, Baruch Hashem, have become Shomrei Mitzvahs. Many have become B'nai Taira. Many are still learning in yeshivas, uh, even after many, many years. So indeed, there's a great, great success. But what often happens is that after we make people from, we then move on to the next group of people that we have to work on. We have a checklist. We check them off, uh, just like the Indians would count the scalps. We have our numbers, and we go on to the next person not recognizing that even after a person becomes a Shomer Mitzvah, they still need a lot of connection to a Rebbe or a spiritual system that can nurture them and that can sustain them. And to some degree, if they're in another yeshiva, maybe that'll, that'll give it to them. But again, let's say somebody is working. Even in other yeshivas, people don't necessarily develop a connection uh, to Rebbeim. But we kind of neglect the people that are already from, because, well, they don't, you know, we don't, well, I was going to say they don't need us, but really, we don't need them anymore. We might say we already tick them off, check them off the list. Now, to some degree, this is actually a function of the economics of Kirov. I don't want to get into that, in which uh, even the financial assistance to Kirov is a function of how many people you converted or how many people you were Makarev. So consequently, there is a great emphasis on a numbers game 
which can sometimes be counterproductive. But we do have to recognize that when somebody enters Kal Yisrael and they don't have the family system, they don't have the background, they don't have a childhood over many years building up certain things that are obvious, there are going to be many stages of life which would almost be simple and instinctive to an FFB, a from person from birth, that a Balchuva might not be familiar with. So, for example, the issue of what is a Jewish marriage? How do you raise uh, children? How do you make decisions as to what is appropriate in your home when you came from a background in which all sorts of things were allowed? Uh, these are issues which perhaps if you lived as a religious Jew, you just absorbed. You didn't have to have a class in it. But the ever since, many, many Balchuva, especially if they don't have family support on either side of the uh, simply uh, flounder. They don't know where to go. And this is a major, major issue. A person might spend years in yeshiva and hopefully know how to learn a taisvitz. Hopefully, not, not always either. Uh, but they don't necessarily know how to be a husband. They don't necessarily know how to be a father. They haven't necessarily had religious role models to instruct them in that way. And this is really the crisis of what we might call second stage kiru meaning somebody's already from, and then they face all the different questions of life, and they don't necessarily know where to go. And uh, sometimes uh, we are guilty, uh, we, we who are involved in, in uh, Jewish education, care of education, are sometimes guilty of not remaining fully connected to those who have gone on, Baruch Hashem, to live a Torah life, but may, might not necessarily have the guidance and the hadracha uh, that, that, that they need. So that's uh, one thing to keep, keep in mind, that uh, just because somebody becomes a Shomer Shabbos, that is not the end of their chinuch. I mean, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, somebody asked me a shayla, a newly married chassan asked me a shayla. He asked me, how many minutes should he talk to his wife a week? Now, I, I, could, I, I, could have, you know, I could give him an answer, I suppose, but the very fact that the question was asked means there was something that was a little missing there. Like, you know, why doesn't a person like, figure that out? But the answer is, the emphasis, in his defense, a person becomes from, he, you know, even the common sense, maybe that's a problem, you shouldn't get rid of your common sense, but you don't know anymore. The simple, most obvious things that you did take for granted in your prior life, you don't know. Are they still valid? Are they still not valid? A lot of times they are valid, and I'll get to that. But a person doesn't know. You know, I know that in the secular world, husbands talk to wives. Okay, I know that, but maybe that's a secular thing. Maybe that's not a Jewish thing. So people ask, right? So a person has to know, or Rebbe has to know, that even things that might be pushed and common sense have to be articulated, they have to be explained, not because our students lack intelligence. Baruch Hashem, we have brilliant, brilliant students, uh, very, very accomplished people but simply because when you don't have an experience base to measure it against, you just don't know. And therefore, a Rebbe and anyone that's metapel with uh, Talmudim has to be aware that even the obvious things. Somebody once told me they, uh, years ago, they went to the, uh, to the old Soviet Union uh, to meet secretly with Jews that were Shomer Mitzvahs. This was the age of the Refuseniks in the 1970s. And there were Yidden who were meiser nefesh mamish to keep Torah and mitzvos when they could have certainly, they could have been sent to Siberia. And uh, they hand wrote, uh, someone gave them a copy of the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, and they hand wrote uh, manuscripts of the Kitzur and they circulated it among the groups and they were Shomer mitzvos. And the person noticed that when one of the people was making Kiddush, the American noticed that, that when a person was making Kiddush, uh, the cup was on the table. He wasn't holding the cup. So he mentioned, you know, he's supposed to hold the cup. He says, well, I looked in the kitzer. The kitzer doesn't say to hold the cup. Now, I, I, I honestly don't, don't know if that's the case or not, but if it wouldn't say it, that's because it was so obvious. Every Jew knows you hold the cup for Kiddush. It didn't have to be said. But for a Russian Jew who had been minutak from Yiddishkeit for decades, yeah, you have to tell it. You've got to hold the cup when you make, when you make Kiddush. Right, so this is something that, that we need to be aware of. And here, though, I want to uh, mention a point that I think is, is important as well. And that is, 
when Hannah, Shmuel's mother, when Hannah prayed for a child, so she prayed that she should be given a zera anashim, a man among men, or a child among men, among people. What is among people? So the Gemara says what she meant was, not too tall, not too short. I pray for an average kid. Please give me an average child. Very, very strange. First of all, if that was the case, her prayer was not answered. Shmuel, the shakal, commercial v'yaren. What type of parent is going to pray, please, Hashem, give me mediocre kid. I want mediocrity. Avada, it's a never pushing. Chana was not asking for a mediocre child. She also, like every parent, she wanted a tzaddik. She wanted a great person. But what she was asking for is, she wanted his greatness not to be distorted. She wanted all facets, facets of his greatness to be in balance and coordinate. So in a sense, he was a normal person. When we say be normal, people sometimes look at that as kind of a curse. Normal? You just want me to be normal? I want to be special. I want to be exceptional. But the truth of the matter is, normality is a great bracha. Normality is the person that is Yeshe vi Isaac Batayra Bahasmada Rabba, but knows the names of his children and their birthdays. Normality is the person that learns and steigs and grows in learning, but gets his wife flowers on her anniversary. Normality is the person who again is learning and being Isaac and Avaita Sashem, but when somebody says good morning to them, they don't say Bittal Torah, don't interrupt me during Satan. There is, even in Tyra, on some level, on some level, too much of a good thing in which a person becomes obsessive and compulsive about one particular nakuda, and it's like a person who is lifting weights in which you want to develop the strength of your pinky. So you lift, you know, a thousand pounds on your pinky, so you have a gigantic pinky, and the rest of your body is nothing. Out of proportion, doesn't fit. Normal is all the pieces fit together. You understand that Taira is about being a certain person. Taira is about making you a certain person. It's not an end in and of itself, it's an emtsai towards making you who you have to be. And that is essentially a person in which all of the chalokim, shtim, all of the chalokim hang together, a balanced person. And the truth of the matter is, I, I think I want to blame, to some degree, uh, the biographies of Gedaila for contributing to a misconception. Uh, Rav Huttner mentioned this many, many years ago. Well, the Bruch Hashemachi, the biographies have improved in recent years. Rav Huttner mentioned he didn't like Gedaila biographies. Why? Because the Gedaila biographies are all the same. They describe a four-year-old finishing Bavli, and he made his seam on Yerushalmi at five years old, uh, by 11, Kisve Arizal, etc., and it talks about feats of super genius and super brilliance and super asmada. And I read those stories. And what do I get from those stories? I'm impressed, I'm amazed, I'm entertained. But it's not no gay on me at all. It's not what I can do and it's not anything I can aspire to. So all it does is give me a window into the curiosities of the world. There's the world's strongest man and the world's smartest man and the world's biggest masmid. And it's like, you know, Ripley's believe it or not. Uh, in a from in a from packaging. Rav Huttner tiny it that the Emma says we have to know that Gedolim themselves had their struggles. Gedolim themselves had their nisyonos. And we need to know sometimes, again, there'd be a Shailah of Lashon Hara, how much you could say, it is, it, it is a Shailah Shacha. But we need to know that they too had difficulties. And how they surmounted their difficulties is so inspirational to us. And we also need to know the balance in their character. There are biographies that talk about Gedola not knowing their children's names. By and large, I want to tell you, I, I know firsthand that some of the biogra biographical statements are false. They are not true. And they're trying to do something that creates an image that can be very, very destructive. When a Ben Tyra might say, oh, I, I shouldn't you know, recognize my children's birthdays because so-and-so didn't, even though it wasn't even true. 
So I just want to tell you a few mice from uh, my experience and some of it is other experiences about what it means for a gadol to be balanced. Now a gadol in balance is a very interesting point because if balance means everything hangs together, then that means as his greatness in Tyra grows and grows and grows, the greatness in Midos grows to the same degree. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in balance. Even if he had good Midos and then became tremendously great in Torah, that would be an imbalance. That's like an overdeveloped pinky once again. So consequently, you will find among those who are the greatest in Torah, you will find the greatest in Midos because that is normalcy, meaning you allow the Torah to be mashpia you, to make you into a certain type of person, and not simply say, learn, 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 that's all you're supposed to do. So I mentioned, I mentioned it before, forgive me for mentioning it again, Rav Moshe Feinstein used to visit, I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, Rav Moshe used to visit Hartford, Connecticut two weeks in the summer. He had a relative uh, there, and we used to say, even as a kid, we used to make the joke, he wanted to go to the only place in the world where nobody would ask him any shilas for two weeks. And that was kind of the community, but he was there. And uh, I was still, it was towards the end of the school year. It was, it was before summer vacation. And I was Zoha to be in the car that would take him to Shul in the morning. I would go to Shachris before I went to school. I was in fourth grade. And I would sit in the car and I remember everything. I remember I was watching him like a hawk. I was, when I, it was the first time I saw a person when he would wrap up his, I had never seen this in my life, when he was wrapping up his tefillin, he was learning Mishnayis. I had, I had never even seen such an idea. Between Aliyah, see, he would, he would go over all the way to the Balkore, he had a Chumash and he had a Mishnah, Mishnayis Tyrus he was learning. And when the Balkore started laning, he opened the Chumash. As soon as the Balkore stopped, he closed the Chumash, opened the Mishnah. I, you know, that Hasaga I had much had never seen in my, in my life. Uh, didn't understand a word he said. He spoke a Yiddish that was difficult for even people who knew Yiddish. But the Hadras Panim, I remember the glow of the Shekhinah from his face. I absolutely remember as a nine-year-old. But here's my little story. I was going to send it to art school. I didn't get it in on time. Uh, and that is, uh, one time it was raining. And I was still davening. I was going to walk to school. It was two blocks away. Rabbi Moshe had left with the people that took him home. Around 15 minutes later, somebody comes into the show and says, Rabbi Feinstein said, we have to go back and get you because he remembered you were in the car and he didn't want you to walk in the rain. So he asked me to come back and give you a ride. Now, I was nine years old. I did not care about walking in the rain. I still don't. And not only that, all the people who knew me didn't care either because all of you knew me, they didn't know. <laughs> hey, the kid's going to walk to school in the rain. Big deal. So who is the one person who cared? Gadol Ador, that every single Shaila of Klal Yisrael is on his shoulders. Matters of life and death, agunas, medical ethics, um, the interaction with the conservative reform, all of the Shailas of Klal Yisrael, Rav Moshe had to deal with. And yet, he's aimed on the fact that he didn't want a nine-year-old to, uh, to, uh, to walk in the rain, two blocks in the rain. I have to tell you, of all of the things that are powerful influences in why a person wants to embrace the Derech HaTorah, I can tell you that is very, very powerful. You can't imagine how powerful that is, more so than whatever Kuzari principle or reputation of Darwin you could come up with. That said, if that's what godless and Torah means, I want to be connected to that in some way. Because look at this greatness. We have the Steichler. Here in Eretz Yisrael, the stipler. And these days, who's the stipler? Rav Chaim Knevsky's father. We used to say Rav Chaim Knevsky was the stipler's son. Baruch Hashem, you have two dairis of Mamesh Gedol Olam. Uh, but the stipler, uh, who was towards the end of his life, besides the fact that he couldn't hear, was very, very weak. It was extremely difficult for him to walk. And there was a bar mitzvah in B'nai Brak. And in the middle, which he wasn't invited, I mean, his family didn't even know him, and it was three miles away from his house. And then in the middle of the bar mitzvah, he huffs and he puffs and he had walked three miles on Shabbos. And he goes over to the bar mitzvah boy and he whispers something to him and shakes his hands and then he turns around and he walks another three miles. And the family is mishtaiming. The family goes over to him and says, what happened here? What's this chris? And he said, well, four years before, 
he was davening with his Zaydi in the Letterman Beis Knesset, the Stipley Show. And he was carrying a gigantic machshar, a very big machshar that's the size of a Gemara for his Zaydi who couldn't read. And the Stipler told him, thought it was a Gemara, says, you shouldn't learn during davening, now is this man tefillah. And when he showed the Stipler that this was a sitter, the Stipler says, I, I have to ask mechila from you. I hurt your feelings. But you're a katan. A katan cannot give mechila. So tell me when your bar mitzvah was. The kid was nine years old. So he told the stipler the parsha of his bar mitzvah. Four years later, the stipler walks three miles. And I can tell you it was a lot harder than for any of us to walk three miles. To be mavakish mechila from a person on the days of his bar mitzvah. The sensitivity of a, of a gadol. Rav Steinman. We have so many maizam about Rav Steinman. Zichroin al-Livracha. Of course he was a gadol b'tayra. That's, that's, that doesn't need to be said. But what needs to be emphasized are the midos that such a great person has, uh, in which uh, the story goes, there was a kid in Bnei Brak from a from family. Again, it's a famous story by now. And this child, unfortunately, very much went off the derech. Ad kach, that he was about to get married to an Arab. He was about to intermarry, which... In Eretz Yisrael, even in among Chilonim, is comparatively rare compared to Chutz Laris. But he was, he was going to do that. But he, had, he was spending a last Shabbos with his parents. His parents said, spend one Shabbos with us. And he said, I'll do that, but on the condition that I can use my iPad. Uh, I mean, an iPad in Bnei Brak, even during the week, would be a big problem. But this on Shabbos, I'm going to be in the Merpeset, I'm going to use it for Rabbin. And the parents said, listen, we're not going to stop here right now, but just Spend the Shabbos with us. And as the Shabbos went on, the father said, I'm going to a shir by Rav Steinman. Would you like to go to the shir? The father doesn't even know what was his havamina to even ask his son. But Hashem put that thought in his mind. And the son said, yeah. The father doesn't know why. They go, they, go, they have a shir, etc. And at the end, he goes to Rav Steinman. And the father says, unfortunately, my son has gone off the derech. Uh, He's Machal Shabbos. He's going to marry a, a guy. Uh, can the Rav, can the Rosh Hashiva give him a bracha? So Steinman said to him, "Have there ever been times in your Chilul Shabbos that you've thought of doing tshuva?" And he says, "Yeah, a few times." How long has the, how long have those times been? He says, 10 minutes here, fifteen minutes here." And Rav Steinman said, "I'm jealous of you." Because in those 10 or 15 minutes, you were much greater than me. Because the place where the Baal Tshuva stands is greater than the Tzadik Gomer. You reached Madregos that are much higher than the Madregos I achieved. And from that conversation, the boy became from, but there's a prior story. The father then asked the son, why did you go to the Shia? I mean, you were listening, you were using your iPhone, your iPad on Shabbos. Why, why did you go to the Shia? He says, because 10 years earlier, something happened in my cheder with Rav Steinman. And I remembered it. Our, our class was taken for him to give us a bechina. And everybody who answered a question right got a candy. And he asked me a question. I didn't know anything. He then asked me a second question. I didn't know anything. An easier question, an easiest question. I didn't know anything. So after everybody left, Rav Steinman asked me to stay. And he said, I'm giving you three candies. Because in Taira, the sechar is based on how you work, not what you know. And you had to work to try to answer three questions. So you get three candies. And the boy said he had forgotten that story. But when the father had reminded him, he said, let's go to Rav Steinman share. He had remembered that here was somebody who was not Mavatalim, who didn't reject him, who saw the good in him no matter how far he went. And this is a very, very significant point of being machshiv a person, of being balanced, being normal, and in terms of your interaction, seeing the good in people. And from that good is how they do tshuva. And that brings me to my final point. Again, I, the time is, is running out, and that is, there are two types of modalities of tshuva that a person can do. There is a tshuva that might be called an amputation. I reject my past. I no longer have a shaykhus to it. 
I am somebody new, I simply cut it off and make believe it doesn't exist. Sometimes that's necessary. Just as sometimes medically you have to amputate a limb, sometimes you have to amputate a life, a past life. But just as amputation medically is only a last resort, not a first resort, amputating a past is not the highest and deepest level of doing tshuva. The deepest level of doing tshuva is when you take those aspects of your past and they become the foundation of what you are. Because a tshuva, where you amputate yourself, can often lead to depression, it can often lead to sadness, it can often lead to feeling I'm an incomplete person. So you know, you come to Yerushalayim, and you meet Yerushalmis, you meet Sadiqim, who have been here for 500, found, been here for 500 years, and you come from North Dakota, or you come from wherever you come, and you say, what exactly am I going to accomplish? So I'll be in yeshiva for 10 years and I'll be as good as his fifth grader there. Like, what am I? I'm nothing. So here is the secret you need to know. It is true that the 10th generation Yushalmi has many, many gifts that we don't have. It's true. But the guy from North Dakota has something the 10th generation Yushalmi doesn't have. If the Abishter put your neshama in a certain place, in a certain environment, in a certain family, and you did not make a decision, this was not a function of your Bechira, this is the environment you were put in, then the Abishter is saying, the way you become close to him is from that environment itself. You may have to modify it, you have to direct it, but not by simply making believe it doesn't exist, because then you're telling HaKadosh Baruch Hashem, you made a mistake, you just put me in the wrong place. Can't be. God does not make mistakes. So Mimela, a much deeper tshuva than the tshuva of amputation, is the tshuva of transformation, where you take from the past and that becomes your kaya. Just like a former drug addict can be a better addiction counselor because of the addiction than he would have been had he not had that at all. So he's not supposed to make believe he never was addicted. Lehepech. He draws on that, and that's his strength. Many of you remember, the older people remember, the great Rashiva of Mir of Nassim Svi Finkel. Now, he was not a Balchubi, he grew up in a very hush of a family, but everyone knows the story. He grew up in Chicago, uh, co ed's high school, on the basketball team, on the debating team. So, when he was Nifter, tragically young, we did not expect it, when he was Nifter. So, the Hespedim all had a common theme. And the theme was, look at the fact that no matter what a lousy background somebody comes from, they can escape it and they can become great. Now, that is a message, and I must him, that is a message. But, since I came from somewhat of a similar background, I was a little, little hurt, well, you know. And I think maybe there's an op opposite message. Again, it's Eilav Yelav Dibre Elokim Chaim, it's not a stira. But I think there's an opposite message. That part of his greatness was not that he became a godol, notwithstanding the environment he came from, but he used that environment as a chalik of his godless. Those who knew the Rosh Hashiva know that one of his many, many kochos was his ability to relate to every type of American teenager. An American teenager comes to Eretz Yisrael and sees people learning all day for the whole, for the, for the, uh, first time in his life, he doesn't understand like what type of world is this, what are they doing, even if he's orthodox. And then he meets the final the Rosh Hashiva of, of, of 7,000 Talmudim. And there must be a lot of awe and trepidation and fear. And all of a sudden, this bearded tzaddik starts talking about jump shots and uh, hoops. I don't even know the basketball terms myself. And the kid is amazed. And he says, well, of course I know that. I was on the basketball team too. In other words, he did not deny where he came from. Lehepech, he used it as the source of how he connected to people and brought them up. This is not the tshuva of amputation. This is the tshuva of transformation. And we have to be careful. As mechanchim, as mekarvim, we want to help people move in the direction of Torah and mitzvahs. But that doesn't mean we have to call upon them to amputate. 
People have parents who are not religious. So is the message, forget about your parents. Well, the parents taught midos, derech eretz, decency. Aren't these things that we got from our parents, even if they're not religious? Honesty. Are these things that we simply make believe don't exist? One has to be very, very careful. Ideally, a tshuva should not involve cutting off family. It should not involve disassociating from parents. One has to uh, obviously get piske halacha regarding kashras issue. I mean, there are, there are going to be issues. But by and large, Yiddishkeit should build bridges and not destroy them. It should open doors and not close them. Rebel Yashif said that the primary mission of our generation is to make the name of Hashem beloved. Shem Shuan Yisayev Al Yadecha.